Atari was far ahead of its competitors when it was released, due mainly to its superior graphics capabilities. This was largely due to the anti-chip that served as the graphics processor with its own instruction set and program for drawing on the screen, also known as the display list. The display list makes it possible to mix graphics modes, giving the programmer great flexibility for drawing screens with both text and graphics. Unfortunately, each graphics mode was limited to a small number of colors despite the Atari having 256 total colors to choose from with the GTIA chip. For example, Graphic Zero is a text mode that can display 40 columns by 24 rows of characters with only two colors for the background and the text. Graphic Zero is even more limited than that because the color of the text is dependent on the background color and thus cannot be set independently. Fortunately, the Atari engineers built a remedy for these restrictions and it's called a display list interrupt. The display list interrupt, also known as a DLI, makes it possible to control the background color of every line drawn on the screen. This interrupt is sometimes referred to as a raster interrupt or horizontal blank interrupt. The Atari 8-bit home computers were the first to do this. Learning about display list interrupts can be difficult to learn for several reasons. First, it's used in conjunction with other features of the Atari including display lists and player missile graphics that can each take time to learn and understand. Second are a number of details that must be taken care of in the right order to implement a display list interrupt. Third, the code that runs during the interrupt to set the parameters of the next scan line to be drawn must be written in assembly language since it is run during the horizontal blank which has precious few CPU cycles and thus must be executed quickly. There is no easy way to learn DLIs, but hopefully this explanation will not be that difficult since we've approached programming the Atari display in several distinct steps and videos, each one getting deeper into the how-tos of the Atari graphics subsystem. The first thing you need to know is that the Antic chip is busy working with the GTIA to draw the screen while the CPU is busy with the computations required by the software. This was a huge advance over the Atari 2600 that lacked a graphics chip resulting in a CPU that was burdened with drawing the screen one scan line at a time. The only time the 2600 CPU had to do in-game computations was during the horizontal blank, a brief pause at the end of each scan line, and the vertical blank, a little bit longer pause, when the last of the 192 scan lines comprising the screen was completed. With the 8-bit computers, the Antic gets its marching order from its display list that is created automatically when a graphics mode is specified in BASIC or a custom display list with multiple graphics modes is created. With the display list in hand, Antic goes about its business drawing the screen within the limitations of each graphics mode it's asked to draw. The display list interrupt essentially tells the Antic to signal to the CPU that there is a non-maskable interrupt. This happens when Antic gets to the end of the current scan line. The CPU stops what it is doing and then runs or services a small assembly language routine you provide at a specified memory address. This bit of code changes the graphics registers controlling the display. Once the code is executed, the CPU goes back to what it was doing. The Antic then uses the new graphics setting on the next scan lines until another display list interrupt is called. Calling a display list interrupt every mode line means that you can give each line a different color. This makes it possible to have 24 different colors for each of the 24 different graphic mode zero lines, which are eight scan lines per mode line that make up the total 192 scan lines of the screen. So now that we've learned a little bit about display list interrupts, let's go ahead and take a look at the code for an actual display interrupt. All right, so we're here at our Mac 65 editor slash assembler environment. If you guys aren't familiar with this environment, I've got a video. I'll create the link up at the top. You can go learn about Mac 65 and how to create your own assembly language programs on the Atari 8-bit computer line. 
But in any event, let me go ahead and show you some code that I've created here. And what this code is going to do is it's going to install a display list interrupt routine in memory that the operating system will then call on specific scan lines of our display. So as we talked about before in our last video, and if you haven't watched the last video on display list interrupts, I'm going to include a link right now for that uh, on the video in the upper right hand corner for you to go watch that video because it's important that you get the basics down before we get here. Um, so anyway, in this listing, as we talked about in the prelude of this video, the display list interrupt routine is a small bit of code that you can place into memory that will be executed um, upon certain drawing of certain scan lines on your display. Now what that requires for you to do, like we talked about before, is you have to enable the display list interrupt bit on the particular display list line or instruction that you're interested in having call this display list interrupt. So let's take a quick look back at the graphics the, uh, slide for the actual display list for graphics mode zero. And if you look here, you will see that we have 24 lines of text in graphics mode zero. Now each line of text is comprised of eight scan lines. So the smallest unit of display for graphics mode zero that we can install and interrupt on and have it take effect on that line would be one character mode line of text in graphics mode zero. So for let's go back to the code now that I've created. If we look here, let's just go down the code and I'll explain it to you line by line and then we'll execute it and you'll have a better idea of how it works. So line one is a typical line I put in all of my assembly code listings that basically um, tells me the file name and a command that lists the source code to the disk so I don't forget and call the, the code something different than what I'm working on. Line 20 and 25 are simple comments. Line 30 is our um, assembler directive that tells the assembler that we want to create object code in memory. Line 40 is the starting address in memory for our program. Line 50 defines a label called WSYNC uh, and that's going to reference memory location D40A. So if we go and we look at location D40A, which I'm actually doing right now, I'm looking in my mapping the Atari, and I'm going to go to D40A so we can look at that, and I can read to you what it says. Okay, so D40A stands for Wait for Horizontal Synchronization. Allows the OS to synchronize the vertical TV display by causing the 6502 to halt and restart seven machine cycles before the beginning of the next TV line. It's used to synchronize the BBIs, aka vertical blank interrupts, or DLIs, display list interrupts, with the screen display. So what this is going to do is when we put something in location D40A, it's going to cause the 6502 to halt until that particular scan line is finished drawing to the right side of the screen and it's ready to come back and reset itself to the left side. So it gives us like a, a sync to the left side next scan line. Okay, line 60. Color COLPF2. That stands for the color of uh, Playfield 2. D018. That's going to be the background color of our graphics mode 0. And you're going to see where that's going to come into play. Now, starting at line 70, 80, and 90, this is where we're going to start our display list interrupt routine. Now, 70 through 90 are just comments, but line 100 is where the code actually starts. So whenever you write a display list interrupt routine, you need to save the state of the registers. More importantly, the accumulator onto the stack and that's what I'm doing here. I've got a label called DLI and that label just represents the beginning of the display list interrupt routine. PHA push the accumulator onto the stack and then 
we're going to load the accumulator with hex value 30. Now, on the emulator, the Atari 800 Max X emulator that I'm using to create this demo on, uh, the NTSC value for deep dark red is 30. If you compile this program on an actual Atari, it will be a little off. It might be a little bit more pink than red. You'll have to adjust it. But for all intents and purposes, for this tutorial, we're going to use 30, which represents red. And then right away, what we're going to do is we're going to store that value into that WSYNC that we just talked about, D408. Now, according to the documentation, it doesn't matter what value you store into WSYNC. As long as you store something into that location, it will cause the horizontal or the vertical, the, the horizontal sync line to synchronize. It'll halt the 6502 and it will cause it to synchronize. You can use any value you want. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to also store that color value into the color play field number two. So what we're, what we're saying here is as soon as this DLI interrupt runs, it's going to load red right into the accumulator, wait for the next line to sync up, and then we're going to store red. Okay, once we do that, every line after this particular horizontal line, and we'll talk about which horizontal line that is, or vertical line more importantly, is going to be red. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we need to restore from the stack, the accumulator, PLA, and we're going to return from our interrupt with an RTI. Notice we're not using RTS, return from subroutine. We're using RTI, return from interrupt. And that's basically our return, our, our display list interrupt routine, lines 100 through 170. It's short, it's sweet, it changes the color um, from play, for play field number two for all subsequent um, scan lines to be drawn, and then it returns. So now let's go to our actual main program that's going to be installing this display list interrupt into memory and setting our display list to call it. So line 205, we've got, we got a temp label, CE, that's an unused memory location by BASIC and the operating system. It's a safe uh, byte to place data. I'm also in line 215 setting up another um, label called DLIST in location CC, again, another safe location in memory that's pretty much guaranteed not to be used by BASIC or the operating system or the assembler language cartridge for that matter. And then what we're going to do in line 216 is this is where we're going to load a pointer to our display list. So we're going to grab locations 230 and 231, which in memory is always pointed to the beginning of the display list. So 230 being the low byte, 231 being the high byte, and we're going to shove those values into our display list. So D list is going to be the beginning of our display list. Real quick, let's refer back to our graphics mode zero display list, and you will see D list is going to be pointing to that first 112. All right. So back at our assembly language code, we need to grab the low and high byte of that display list uh, routine that we created higher up and we labeled it DLI, the display list interrupt. So we're going to grab those two values and we're going to store those into 200 and 201. Now, why are we using 200 and 201? Let's go over to mapping to the target and see what locations those are in memory and what they represent. So 200 and 201. 200 and 201, according to mapping the Atari, is the vector for the non-maskable interrupt display list interrupt. It contains the address of the instructions to be executed during a DLI. So there you go. If you're going to write a display list interrupt, you're going to be placing the pointer in memory, low byte, high byte, to that routine that you write into 200 and 201. So that's what we're doing right here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to take our stock display list and we need to modify the particular byte or particular line instruction in that display list 
that we want to actually call the display list center up. Now, display list uh, by default, for example, graphics mode zero display list does not have bit eight or you know defined bit seven actually turned on, which is the bit that we need for the display list center up for any of its lines. Okay, because graphics mode zero is not doing a display list center up. So what I've done here in line 299 is I've loaded the Y register with the value of 16. If we look back at our graphics zero display list and we move down 16 bytes into the display list, we're going to hit the number two right here that represents half halfway down through our display list. In other words, our display list is 24 lines of text. Well, this is going to be line 12, okay? Because what I'm attempting to do here is I'm attempting to make half of our display a different color than the stock blue. So that's why I choose, or that's why I chose number 16. And then what we're gonna do in the next line, line 300, is we're gonna load the accumulator indirectly with the first pointer or the memory location where the display list is loaded and we're going to index that with the Y register which is going to give us the starting of the display list over 16 memory locations. So 16 memory locations beyond the beginning of the display list that's going to give us the number two the display list mode line number two that we're interested in starting our interrupt. Now, that's going to give us back um, the bits for that byte that were set originally by the number two to tell it that we want graphics mode zero. Well, guess what? We need to flip bit number seven on because right now it's off. All the bits are off for all the mode display lines. And the way we do that is we do an exclusive OR with a 128. And as you know, bit mat bit math wise, excuse me, by exclusively orient a 128, we're basically turning on bit number seven and we're making sure that this particular line in the display list has the interrupt flag set, display list interrupt flag set. And this is what that will look like in memory once we set that bit on. So instead of being mode two without the bit on, it's going to turn into a mode line two with the interrupt bit on. And then on line 310, we're going to store that value that we've exclusive ORed directly back into display list on that particular mode line. So now that mode line is modified in our display list. Now the last thing we need to do in order to make this display list interrupt active is we have to store a 192 into memory location D40E. Now, if you look at location D40E and you're mapping the Atari, you're going to see that this memory location is known as the non maskable interrupt enable. So, we're going to basically shove a 192 into D40E and we are going to enable um, this playlist interrupts for our program. And that's it. Once we do that, our display list is modified. We've got our display list interrupt routine installed into memory. And then it's just going to run indefinitely waiting for a key press to end the program. So without further ado, let's assemble this program. And we're going to run it and we're going to see exactly what's going on here with this display list interrupt. Okay, we're going to enter our debugger. And we're going to execute at memory location 5018, which is where our actual display list interrupt main routine starts. And what did we get? Go 5018. We got nothing. What happened? Hmm. Five thousand B. All right. So we're going to enter our debugger. And we're going to go 5000B, which is where our main program starts. All right, so here we go. As you can see, the top half of our screen is the default blue that's normally associated with our Mac 65 cartridge. But now the lower half is in deep 
red, dark red. So I'm actually going to quit the debugger, quit the program, and I'm going to quit out of the debugger. And as you can see, since we have that display list interrupt installed in memory, it's now active. Even though we're no longer debugging our program, we've put that interrupt in the memory and we've told the computer, guess what? That's our new display interrupt and it's running. So even though our program is done, the interrupt is still taking effect. Now to prove that we're halfway through the screen, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to basically count the number of lines that we have that are blue. Okay, so there we go. You can see we've got an even 12 lines on the top and an even 12 lines on the bottom. All right, so now I wanna show you, I'm gonna warm reset the machine and you'll see that once you warm reset the computer, that display list interrupt vector is restored by the operating system back to its default value. But we could easily go back in there and reinstall it by executing our program and there we, we would have it. Okay. So let's try something. Let's go ahead and warm reset this. Let's go back to our code and let's change the actual line in our display list that we're modifying. Let's back it up a couple lines. Let's back it up to 12. This is gonna be byte number 12 in our display list. And let's see, we're gonna, we're gonna see it start a little earlier in the display, if you will. You see how it moved that red up just a little higher? Okay, let's do that one more time. Let's move it up a little, little further. Let's move it up a couple more bytes. Let's do 08. All right. So this might be kind of cool if you're doing some kind of a educational program or some kind of a word processor where you've got some values up here, you know, you're trying to give the user some feedback on specific, specific things, okay? And then maybe down here is where the actual word processing starts. I think this this might have actually this technique might have actually been used in um, Atari Writer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyway, you can see what the power could be of display lists in order to change the colors on the screen or the background color of the screen using an interrupt. Now, there's other things you can do with interrupt, so you can run pretty much any type of code you want in an interrupt. But this is a good way of showing you how to change, for example, simple things like the background color. All right, so we got another version of the program here. And let's look, take a look at the code and see what we got going on. So it's pretty much the same the first few lines, but you'll notice the DLI routine has changed a little bit here. I don't wanna talk about that. So let's, oops. So let's go down here and look at our DLI routine. So as before, we are pushing the accumulator to the stack. And now we've introduced a new call here. Um, load the accumulator, uh, vcount. Now vcount we have defined up top as D40B. So if we look at our trusty mapping the Atari, we can see that D40B, what does it say, vcount? Vertical line counter, used to keep track of which line is currently being generated on the screen used during display list interrupts to change the color or graphics mode. Peaking here returns the line count divided by two, that's very important, ranging from zero to 130 on an NTSC system. So you gotta keep that in mind that V count returns a line number divided by two. Not sure why that has that way or why they designed it that way. I'm sure it has to do with some sort of a clock signal division or some kind of a, a divisible, you know, math issue. But anyway, just keep that in mind. So V count, that's going to basically return what line 
number is currently being drawn, what scan line is being drawn. So that could come in handy, right? We could detect what scan line number we're on. We could decide at certain scan lines to do certain things and other scan lines not to do certain things. So we're going to use that power to our advantage. So what we're doing here in the display list interrupt is we're loading the current um, vertical line that we're drawing or horizontal line that we're drawing. And then what I've done here is I'm doing a comparison to 3F, which is the number 63, okay? And basically what I'm saying is if we are drawing scan line 63, if it's not equal to 63, I want you to branch out to my next label. So if it is 63, however, it's going to drop through that branch of not equal and load the accumulator with the dark red value as we did before. So what I'm saying here is if it is 63, make it red. Otherwise, skip it. Keep going. And then we go down and we do another comparison on line 111 where I'm looking for scan line number 31. And basically, if it's not 31, we're going to skip that. If it is 31, we're going to set the accumulator with a bright green color, C6. So basically, what we're saying is if we hit scan line 31, change it to green, and keep it green until we hit scan line 63, which we're then going to change to red. So let's take a look at what this does. Let's assemble. If I can get out of this. All right, so let's go into our debugger, execute this code, and voila. Now we've got two display interrupts. And you can see that the first interrupt, which is starting on scan line number 31, is changing the background color to green, and it remains green until we reach the next display list interrupt, or the next display list line that has an interrupt, which is the scan line 63, which we then turn to red. So you can see that you have the power of changing just about any mode line you need using your interrupts just by making sure that you set the flag on those particular mode lines to enable the, the display list interrupt. So with that being said, let's go down a little further in the code and let me show you how I was able to tell the display list to call the DLI on those two particular scan lines. So as we did before, we set our Y index register to 16. We loaded the value from the display list at that particular mode line and we enabled the DLI. And then I did it once again for byte number eight, which is a little higher up in the display list. And I did that also loaded to the accumulator, exclusively ordered 128 and stored it back in the display list. So basically, this is what the new display list looks like after I modified those particular mode lines. The display list interrupt bit for those two mode lines was turned on. Therefore, the DLI routine executed at both of those mode lines, if you will. All right, so we've got one more example here that we want to take a look at. And it's pretty much the same code except for a couple things. Let's take a look first at the DLI area. And what we're doing here is basically, um, let me turn down this click sound a little bit here. Basically what we're doing here is we are beginning the DLI and as before, saving the accumulator on the stack. But what I'm doing next is I'm loading the accumulator with whatever value is in the vertical count. So Whatever vertical line we're working on, horizontal line, I keep saying vertical line, but it's actually the, the vertical line counter, which represents the horizontal line being drawn. Let's load whatever B count is, and let's store it um, right into WSYNC and also the color player field too. So this is going to give us a consistent, every V count, whatever that number represents color-wise, we're going to store it right in the color field. And it's going to give us a nice cool effect, which you'll see in a second. So real simple, whatever V count we're on, store it in the color field. Um, let's go back down and now look at what we're doing to our display list because I'm modifying the entire display list as, as far as it goes with our mode lines for graphics mode zero. So here's where we modify our display list. So let's take a look at what I'm doing here. So basically, 
what I'm doing first is I'm loading my Y, my y register with the number three. Now, number three is byte number three in the display list. In other words, 112, 112, 112, and then that first 66, which is normally the start of the display list, including the mode line number, which is mode line number two. Um, we're basically going to enable, since that is the first line of our graphics mode zero, we're going to go ahead and turn on the DLI flag for that line. And then what I'm going down, I'm doing is I'm skipping down to byte number eight, which is the next mode line in the display list, which happens to be a number two. Uh, we're going to load that into the accumulator. Notice I have a label here called again. This is going to be actually my little loop label. Um, so we're taking mode line number, byte number eight, which is that mode line for graphics mode number two text mode. We're turning on the DLI bit. We're storing it right back in the list. We're going to increment our Y index, which is now going to make it number nine. And we're doing a comparison to say, have we hit byte number 29? Now, let's look back at our display list and let me show you what this loop is going to do. Um, it's basically going to loop through every line or every byte in the display list, and that's exactly bytes number 8 through 29. And we're going to enable the DLI flag for all of these mode lines. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be turning number 2s into 194s. And that's going to enable the DLI, the DLI flag, the display list interrupt flag, for every text mode line of our graphics mode zero. So back to our loop here. We're incrementing. We're comparing to 29. If it's not equal, we're going back up here. And we're loading the value again. We're turning on the bit, storing it, and incrementing. So we're basically going in a, in a, in a loop here, changing all of our graphics mode zero lines to graphics mode zero lines with the DLI display list interrupt bit turned on. So again, we're enabling the DLI for every graphics mode zero line. And then we go ahead and we enable our DLIs as normal. So let's go ahead and assemble that. And we can see here that our program is actually starting in memory location 500C right there. Go into our debugger, execute 5000C, and woohoo, there's our sort of rainbow pseudo color effect. <laughs> it's not really a, an even tone of colors, but each one of these colors represents uh, V count. Whatever, whatever value V count is at that particular time, um, that's the color that we get. So it's kind of a cool effect. You can see though, what we're doing is we're changing the colors for each one of the graphics mode zero lines. So anyway, let's go ahead and warm restart this guy. And hopefully, let's see, how do we do that again? There we go. Hopefully, guys, this little tutorial here gives you uh, an understanding of what you need to do to create a display list interrupt, install it in memory, and then modify the vector that points to it so that it takes over your display. Now remember, this display list vector interrupt, or I'm sorry, this display list interrupt can be used for any type of display list you have, any graphics mode that you have. Um, you can get, when you're dealing with graphics modes uh, 7 and 8, which are very high resolution for the Atari, I mean, you can get into modifying each one of the 192 scan lines and make them specific colors that you're looking for. So anyway, that's going to wrap up this episode for display lists. I probably have one more coming up, which we're going to talk about vertical blank interrupts and put it all together. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, make sure you subscribe to the channel, guys. Make sure you like this video. Let's keep the mo momentum going on programming on the Ataris and assembly language. Um, I think these machines have so much life left into them. And uh, I really want to get as many people out there as possible programming on the Atari. It's a great learning tool for learning about uh, the binary way in which computers operate. Um, assembly language is a great language to learn that gets you down to the processor level of understanding how coding works. 
and let's get everybody involved that's into retro computing and loves Ataris. And you know, these tutorials also uh, are beneficial for the Commodore users out there, the VIC-20 users out there, any other platform out there. You know, you're going to learn something from these videos um, that's going to allow you to flow into that, those platforms. And we'll actually get into those platforms at some point too. I really want to get into some VIC-20 programming and assembly and also Commodore 64. But I think I've talked enough. I'll see you guys in the next video. Go Atari.